I'm Bob Rack, and I'm the uh, coordinator of environmental science and technology here at Bristol Community College. And I'm also the uh, faculty advisor for the Seeds of Sustainability group, which put all this, if you've come to different things, put all the Earth Month activities on. The students have uh, done a great job on this. And if you have a chance, you can look at the front page of the Fall River Herald News on this past Sunday, April 21st, and even go online on that day, and you'll see some of the things from our Earth Day event that we had uh, last Wednesday. And so today for our speaker, we have Eric Azadurian. He's a senior fellow with the World Watch Institute. And during his 17 years with World Watch, Eric directed two editions of Vital Signs and five editions of State of the World, including the 2017 edition, Earth Ed, Rethinking Education in a Changing Planet, on a Changing Planet, and 2013 edition, Is Sustainability Still Possible? And the 2010 edition, Transforming Cultures, From Consumerism to Sustainability. Eric also designed Catan Oil Springs, an eco-educational scenario for the popular board game, The Settlers of Catan. And he created Yard Farmers, a reality TV show that would follow six millennial Americans as they exit the consumer economy to live with their parents and become sufficiency farmers. While never produced, it was an attempt to normalize and even popularize a path of economic degrowth in the US. Eric is also an adjunct professor at Gaucho College in their environmental studies master's program. And so without further ado, I'd like to present Eric Think about it. Uh, yeah, I think it's okay. okay. The lights are okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Bob. And thank you to the Seeds of Sustainability group for having me and, and Nancy for helping coordinate this. Uh, it's definitely a privilege to uh, join you for Earth Week uh, and uh, come back to uh, BCC again for, I guess, uh, second year in a row, which I, I really appreciate. Uh, especially since the commute this time was much shorter uh, than, than before. I'm, I'm in Connecticut now. Uh, I, I've been impressed coming the two times. I, I had a chance to walk around the, the pond this time a couple times and listen to the red-winged blackbirds speak to me, or to each other probably, uh, and, uh, and to see last time the campus in the, the emptied out mall. Uh, so there's real neat things going on, both in the, in the departments of sustainability and environmental studies, but also just with the campus. Uh, so that's really exciting to see. But I do today want to give some context about how much further we're going to need to go to get to true sustainability. Is sustainability still possible? Uh, that is a question I'll get to. Um, but really, the ultimate question that's going to drive this talk is what should we do? What do we do in this short window that we have left to really either get us ready for the transition that's coming or get closer to sustainability than we are right now? Before I go into the, that question, I do want to just give some global context. Uh, climate change is obviously on all of our minds. Uh, it's not the only sustainability challenge, but it is the dominant and looming one. This, as you can see, is the last 140 years or so of, of temperature increases, starting uh, back in 1880. Uh, and only towards the end do the effects become truly strong and uh, dramatic. Uh, that's in part because uh, of the increased emissions over the years, but also because of the lag time of, of when emissions are released and their effects. But you can see that even though we're talking about an average of one degree of climate change about right now, uh, depending on when you measure from, uh, in the poles it's hitting uh, two, even four degrees in places. Uh, this is uh, what, what climate scientists are starting to realize is that some days the temperatures are hugely um, exceeding norms, right? 20 degrees centigrade over the long-term average. So we're talking about uh, real disruptions in, in the climate system, which is causing serious uh, secondary effects, like the ocean warming uh, faster, 
Uh, I'll, I have a kind of a, a montage of scary data b because it all came out in the last few months. The oceans are warming 40% faster than estimated just five years ago. The world's glaciers are melting five times faster than they were in the 1960s. That, just, that news came out just, uh, I think, a week and a half ago. The Arctic is warming at twice the rate of the rest of the planet, and Greenland is losing uh, ice six times faster than the 1980s. And that, ha that came out two days ago, right? So the, the science is showing just how quickly uh, things are falling apart. The Antarctic ice is melting six times faster than it did in the 1980s. Um, so when you add up all these together, and you can see the effects of climate change are accelerating, uh, even as we're not actually addressing the root causes, no, I would say the proximate causes of emissions growth, let alone the root causes of population and consumption. But so it's not surprising that even five years ago, scientists started to realize and, and come to the conclusion that certain changes are locked in now. The Western Antarctic uh, glaciers are not stoppable. Uh, you can't, we can't stop the inevitable collapse and breakdown of these and the melting of them because climate change has just gone too far. So that means over the next X number of years, at the time this was written, we were talking two to 300 optimistically. Um, but then again, looking back at those last slides of accelerated warming, maybe less time before we have three meters of sea level rise to, to contend with. Um, on top of the one meter of sea level rise per century or less that comes just through thermal expansion of the oceans. As oceans get warmer, as water gets warmer, it expands. You can't really see it in a bottle uh, because it's not enough mass, but when you're talking about a planet getting warmer, the, the oceans will, will grow, um, they'll rise because of thermal expansion. So at this point, it can't just be about sustainability anymore. It has to be about resilience, too. What do we do with the, the million Miamians and the Venetians and the New Yorkers that suddenly, over these next decades, will no longer be able to, or I should not forget the New Orleanians or the Puerto Ricans, that more and more are not returning to their homes when major flooding or hurricane events happen. Uh, some cities are being proactive. I just read an article about one in the northern United States who's trying to make itself the, the destination for climate refugees, uh, American climate refugees. Move here and uh, make a new life. Uh, it's cold here, but that might be a plus when um, things get really hot in the, in the south. But in reality, um, there are going to be certain lands that are lost. Uh, and uh, maybe today we talk about places, mystical places like Atlantis. Maybe future, future generations will talk about mystical Miami, right? That, that place that used to exist long ago. Uh, this is my little attempt to doctor the, the poster. He's from Miami. Um, so ultimately we're talking about uh, uh, temperature increases that are pretty locked in. If we're really bold and and take uh, bold actions now, maybe we can stabilize at two degrees uh, Celsius climate change. There is still talk at the UN level of one and a half degrees, um, and, and the hope is uh, that we can actually do that. But in reality, um, actions that, would, that we'd need to take are far, far beyond where we are now. And, and the key of limiting temperature to two degrees or less. Two degrees is even pushing it. But once we hit a certain point of temperature rise, and we don't know what that point is. Is it two degrees? Is it one and a half? Is it even less? Um, there's a point where the Earth is pushed from what we grew up in. We, humanity, has you know, grew up in the Holocene era with this level of temperature, which is well adapted to agriculture. There have been times where it's gotten colder, where agriculture it breaks down and famine happens and all that, like the Little Ice Age. We've never experienced what's now called the hothouse earth. Uh, the last time that happened was several million years ago, where there was no ice in the Arctic. There were tropical plants there in the Arctic. 
uh, and, and large crocodiles and other strange life that we find in the fossil record, uh, but it doesn't exist there now because it's cold and iced over now. But if we get to that feedback cycle triggered by a melting Arctic, which then the, the dark water will absorb more heat, uh, methane releases from the permafrost and from the deep ocean, uh, it could spiral out of control and, and lead to, to massive changes. You know, sea level rise, like on this earlier slide, we, there's enough ice out there, if it all melts, we're talking about 80 meters of sea level rise. That's not going to happen tomorrow. Hopefully that will not happen at all, because we take those bold actions needed. But if it does, you know, you know, for good reason, we built on coastlines. Right? We had access to fish, we had access to transportation, um, we built on rivers. But in reality, those are all susceptible to major sea level rises. So we do not want to get to that tipping point. And as you can see by this image, once you get there, it's not like an easy linear shift back to a, um, a Holocene temperature. Uh, once you shift systems, once you cross a tipping point, you can't just easily go back to an old system. So the ideal is that we don't allow that system to shift in the first place. Uh, and climate change is not the only problem. We, we've, we've done a lot in disrupting the phosphorus and nitrogen uh, biochemical flows. We've uh, killed off a lot of species, which has lowered genetic diversity, which is that you know, nature's insurance policy to adapt to uh, new environmental conditions. We've caused more ocean acidification and on and on and on. So there are a lot of, of deep systemic problems that we have released you know, primarily because there are so many of us consuming so much. Right? I mean, you know, you can get it down into the weeds of why is climate change happening, but ultimately Paul Ehrlich and John Holdren said it very well when they used that simple equation, human impact equals population multiplied by affluence or consumption multiplied by the types of technology we use. I equals P-A-T. Uh, and that really is it. I mean, we, there's 7.7 .7 billion of us uh, consuming uh, ever more, sparked by marketing and advertising and, and government policy and the rest, uh, and keeping up with the Joneses. And because of that, we're using 1.6 Earths of, of, of resources each year. That means we're drawing on ecological capital, which is showing itself through things like climate change and other breakdown of, of environmental services. Is it too late to, to stop clim runaway climate change? This estimate uh, suggests that to actually get to, one, to stabilize at one and a half degrees Celsius, we would have to, um, you know, this is the carbon budget left, the CO2 budget left, which is uh, ooh, 365 billion tons, right? And at the current rates of burning, we're talking about we have about eight and a half years uh, of carbon emissions. After that, we've, we've gone, we'll never get, we'll never hold it within one and a half degrees Celsius. Obviously, the hope is that we make significant cuts each year, year after year, five, ten percent, so that we can stabilize at zero carbon emissions within these, I mean, you know, within this, this short time frame. Um, but of course, that's not what's happening, right? Uh, the, you, governments, some governments are still committing to the Paris talks. Those aren't bold enough to actually stabilize at one and a half degrees. Other governments, like the United States, is pulling out actively and you know, pulling back on environmental laws. And many corporations, like Exxon, are, are, you know, are aiming for growth. Right? They're, they're spending more on exploration. They're planning on growing by 20 or 30 percent by um, 2025, I think it is. Uh, so when you have this kind of, of, of trend where Production of fossil fuels is going in the opposite direction. You know, other countries like China and India are still building coal power plants, uh, and those have 30 to 50 year lifespans. So once you build a new power plant, uh, you're pretty locked in to using coal uh, for many more years. And we have the consumer trends that are completely unsustainable in places like the United States, spreading to countries like China and India. 
Uh, one of my pet topics is pet ownership. Uh, you know, the, the idea of pet ownership is great, right? We're socially isolated, we're spread out, and we don't have friends anymore because of the car and the way we've developed and, and individualism and all that. So we buy dogs and cats to, to have companionship. Uh, but now we treat them like family members. We spend a lot on veterinarian care. We fly them around the world with us. Uh, we you know, feed them fancy food. Uh, and there's a lot of money to be made in selling pets and all the stuff that people buy for their pets. So the pet industry has very effectively and aggressively entered new markets, China and India. Uh, and now they, uh, it's really grown huge uh, in part you know, this is an Economist article that came out in the same issue as the Exxon article. I thought, that's why I really found those striking, because here we are celebrating the growth of production, and here we are celebrating the growth of new, new industry um, spreading. But some of the reasons why Chinese are, are explaining why they have, uh, are buying pets is, well, the air is so polluted that I don't want to go outside, so I have my little puppy dog and we watch TV together. Uh, and, and others in India, uh, especially where um, families are, are, you know, are being shrinking and people are, are, children are marrying later, uh, you know, the, the pet companion is, is replacing those social ties. So it's not about pets specifically, but there is more and more opportunity to sell more and more consumer goods to the whole world. And in that process, we we end up increasing the ecological footprint even more and leading to even more disaster. Population is the other piece of that equation where we're at 7.7 .7 billion uh, and there's no real um, stopping it. Right? There, when I first started studying population, uh, the dem demographers at the UN said that, well, we'll stabilize around 9 billion people in 2050. Then they shifted it to about nine and a half billion people because family planning wasn't taking off as well and, and there were some other shifts. Now it doesn't actually peak at nine and a half billion. It just keeps going to um, about 10 billion. And obviously, I'm pretty confident in saying that that's not going to actually happen because we've done so much damage to the earth that there will be famines and epidemics and conflicts. It, the idea that we hit another we hit 10 billion people in 2100, by which by then we'll have at least a, a few meters of sea level rise and disruptions of cities and all that. It's not realistic. But the momentum of population growth is bringing us here, right? And I think most people would agree that we do not want nature's way of population limiting or population control, because nature's way is death. Right? We, don't, we want to find ways where we can bring uh, family planning access, education, uh, comprehensive sexuality education, including in this country where we have high um, you know, youth pregnancy rates, so that people make the decisions that are best for their families and, and ultimately choose smaller families. Uh, the ideal is uh, one-child families until we bring population back down to a a level that the Earth can sustain. Oops. Um, so we're all pretending that everything is fine. Uh, the, you know, the, the, the fossil fuel companies are saying this is fine. Uh, we, we need to keep drilling because people need more oil and need more gas and, and all of that. Um, and yet, nothing is fine. This is fine. I'm okay with the events that are unfolding currently. That's okay. Things are going to be okay. You know, I, I, when I saw that, that was a popular meme a, a while back, and I just, it, it just really resonated with me in the, in the climate catastrophe. The, the author was not referring to climate change in this, but it really, this is us right now. This is fine. You know, we keep on driving, we keep on eating our meat because, well, because it's fine. You know, somebody's dealing with it. Uh, and, it and it's challenging, right? Because, uh, you know, there's also a part of us that struggles as well, maybe it's just too late, so why should I bother? 
Um, and, and Kim Stanley Robinson, the science fiction writer, uh, actually wrote an essay on that topic for State of the World 2013 that still um, really strikes me as, as well communicated. He said, is it too late is actually the wrong question to ask. Um, it's a very disempowering question. Either it's not too late, and that means we have a little bit more time to see fancy islands or have the burgers that we really love, um, or it is too late, and therefore, well, we better go see that island before it's underwater, or you know, enjoy the burger before we're not able to anymore. Um, either way, it, it encourages inaction. Um, he asked instead, how much will we choose to lose, or how much are we willing to lose? And then he actually reinversed that, saying, well, more positively, how much will we choose to save? Because that's ultimately where we are. How much will we choose to save? Uh, and just yesterday, I read this um, Washington Post article uh, if, uh, by Eric Rignon, Rignon the, an Earth System Scientist for NASA and UCAL at Irvine. And uh, this was in the, the increased Antarctic um, melting. Uh, and he was describing, if we do something now, it'll take 30 years to affect the climate and add and another few decades to turn the meltdown of glaciers. So probably half of that signal is already written in stone. This is this, the lock-in we're talking about. But the impact sea level, sea level will have on humanity increases with every 10 centimeters of sea level rise. And right now we are about to commit to multimeter sea level rise in the coming century if we don't do something drastic. I loved it. There was no explanation of what drastic meant in this article. That was the last sentence of the article in the post. Um, so it's left to the reader's imagination. Um, but I won't leave it to your imagination because this is an is a question I've been thinking about for a really long time. Right? I mean, if, you know, so the path that we're on is the business as usual path. Keep building more fossil fuel infrastructure and oil. And that's going to lead to collapse, the multi-meter sea level rise. Um, right now, most of the positive dialogue is the green growth scenario. Uh, right now, that's being captured by the Green New Deal uh, that the Democrats are talking about. But that's also delusional. Right? We can't grow our way to sustainability because growth is what got us into this. Right? We can't take our, our prol pro proliferate uh, energy usage and um, switch it over to renewables because to build that renewable infrastructure, you need a huge amount of fossil fuels. So it's very unrealistic to think that we can grow our way into a renewable energy economy we, without degrowing the demands for energy and shrinking the, the human population in conjunction with that. Ultimately, we need renewables, but um, within a context of a much smaller um, process. So we're going to have to make those hard decisions and make a transition to a, a more sustainable, smaller future, um, but also get ready for the transition uh, in the process. Right? There are going to be some disasters. There is, are going to be some cities lost. And so we'll need to think about that too. So ultimately, I see you know, four strategies that are essential in conjunction with each other uh, that I'll go through now. Uh, resistance being first and, 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 and urgent. Cultural engineering, planning for the transition, and earth education. Uh, uh, I think I'll take a, take a breath. A few years ago, uh, a scientist asked, is earth fucked? Uh, and his answer was uh, that, well, if we do direct action activism, uh, we might be able to slow things down enough that, to buy us enough time so that we can actually implement the, the strategies necessary. Uh, and, and that, you know, there has been talk about resistance and little spikes and flares of resistance, but in the last few years, uh, it's really started to grow much more uh, significant uh, with uh, f you know, indigenous efforts to stop pipelines, uh, you know, efforts to respond to uh, you know, Trump, uh, who has really unraveled a lot of environmental regulations. Uh, and m most recently, the Extinction Rebellion, uh, which is really um, quite impressive, where uh, just uh, a week ago, they had 
uh, I forgot how many, um, let's see, uh, 80, they had actions in 80 cities and 33 countries, and bold actions, shutting down bridges, uh, I heard uh, you know, gluing their hands to metro cars to, to kind of really shut down the public transit, just to shut down the city, to make, make it clear that this wasn't just a symbolic protest, but a true rebellion. Uh, and, uh, and that's what's necessary. The, the, the climate, the school, for, the school cli strike for climate movement is also really impressive, where students are, are stepping out of school and, uh, and going down to uh, town halls and city halls and striking. Uh, in, in March, there were 1.6 million student strikers on all, on, uh, in more than 125 countries in over 2,000 places, right? And I would encourage you all to consider that too. I, Nancy mentioned that uh, you don't have uh, school uh, classes on Friday, which that's okay. You don't have to actively skip classes. Maybe that's a plus. But join the, the efforts in, in to go to Boston, um, to the Capitol there, or even the, the town hall in, in Fall River, and start protesting and, and recognize that uh, this poster says, why learn without a future? But I'd actually argue that the organizing of a strike, the engaging with media and policymakers and school administrators, uh, which I would encourage as well, uh, is, is probably even a better education for the skills needed than, than just classroom work. Uh, so there's a real opportunity to heighten one's education through, this, through joining a global movement. But resistance isn't going to be the end of this, right? We can't just resist and hope that uh, policymakers then make some law changes and all that. There's the, the level of change that is necessary is so far beyond those little tweaks that, that policymakers can do. It's going to need a, a complete re-engineering of our cultures so that living sustainably becomes as natural as living as a consumer is today. Uh, this is a very recent report, uh, just out a, a few months ago. Uh, there was an effort to kind of understand if we were going to achieve the 2030 and 2050 CO2 or carbon reductions, the carbon emissions reductions um, on a lifestyle perspective, what would that mean you know, for an individual in Finland or Brazil or India? And what it means is that by 2030, the average Finnish person would have to reduce their CO2 emissions by 69 percent, by 2050, 87 percent. America's not on here. They didn't do the U.S., but I can only imagine it's certainly far higher than Finland. So maybe it's 93, 95 percent. I'm not sure what level. But so what that means is consumption has to be reduced dramatically. Some might be through some gentle technology changes, but the majority is we're going to be moving from driving to biking or walking eating much fewer calories, um, which ultimately in a, in a country that has an obesity epidemic isn't necessarily bad. Eating less meat, flying almost nothing. Um, you know, even this is a nice comparison between what a one, a three planet lifestyle or a European lifestyle, we're in, we're in a four planet lifestyle here in the US and a one planet lifestyle. And you can see even the number of cars per person drops from a half a car per person to 0.004. So, so we have to get to a walkable, bikeable infrastructure. We have to move where we're not flying around the world just for fun anymore. Uh, there's a lot of changes that are far beyond what policy can do that will need um, the institutions that can change culture, right? So government is a role, business as well, education, which we'll talk about in a second, but in things like media and the marketing. Uh, I joined Nancy's Resilient Sustainability class today, and we were talking about the role and power of marketing. And you know, ultimately, when you have a half a trillion dollars a year selling you soda and you know, pet ownership and you know, traveling to uh, wonderful, exotic locations, people are going to succumb to that. They're going to see the, all that marketing from Apple that, oh, I do need the new iPhone, even though theirs might be fine and even though uh, there's a, a huge ecological impact of getting a new smartphone. So we need you know, shifts in, in the media and marketing system. We need 
uh, reductions in marketing. We need more positive social marketing that sells the sustainable lifestyle. Uh, and that's going to take you know, activism. That's going to take new laws. That's going to take entrepreneurs. Um, and on and on. Traditions and social movements. Social movements is easily pointed to with the climate strikes or the Extinction Rebellion. But traditions play a big role, too. There's more and more effort in, you know, in Christian churches, in the community, in, in, in mosques to uh, add eco messages and, and simplicity messages uh, and share those with the, their parishes. Uh, and all that's going to be necessary to denormalize our hyper-consumptive lifestyle and normalize a sustainable, simpler one. But realistically, I mean, even as I describe that, um, can I imagine us successfully doing that in this short window of time that we have? Mm, no. <laughs> I, I want to, uh, and I hope we can, but there's a, there's a chance that we've, the window is already closed, right, with the lag time, with the, the positive feedback effects. So we need to also plan for this transition. We need to plan for the disruptions that are coming. Uh, that means relocalizing agriculture so that when global agricultural trade fails, uh, we still have food in Fall River or in Boston or in, in my town of Middletown. Uh, we need to reskill and get you know, more um, knowledge and um, basic skills back into the community, whether that's repair or uh, first aid or, or uh, ancestral skills like uh, foraging, food foraging, or 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 carpentry, or, or designing appropriate technologies, and all of that. Uh, what's interesting is that you know, there's a real asset of collapsing now and avoiding the rush. Uh, John Michael Greer says it really well. Um, when disruptions happen, even simple little disruptions like the 2008 recession, which was not an environmental uh, collapse uh, or uh, by any means, but it was disruptive enough where lots of people lost their jobs, their homes. Um, you know, having a basic set of skills now or shifting the way you live, lowering expectations, having more um, income in the informal or what Juliet Shore calls the plenitude economy, uh, you, can, you can insulate yourself from these rapid shifts. Uh, you know, that's, that's, a key, that's a key question. When everything is falling apart and everybody's searching for the same um, survival strategies, if you already kind of have a set of skills that are applicable, whether that's um, you know, sufficiency farming or, uh, or what have you, uh, there's a value. Um, in, in fact, I mean, sufficiency farming for me is one of the most strategic uh, you know, throughout history uh, and including many, and now in many countries, lots of people make um, ends meet by having uh, a little plot, whether that's in their yard or spread out over you know, uh, different areas, uh, where they grow food. You know, vegetables and fruits that they can grow for their own families. They can store some. They can barter or trade some. Uh, and, and I thought, OK, with America's 40 million acres of, of lawn, what better thing to do than to start getting people to convert those lawns which is, when you add up all those lawns, that's, that's the fifth largest crop in America. Uh, and so if you could actually get those 40 million acres into production, uh, growing food, you're displacing all this unsustainable lawn with uh, the fertilizers and pesticides and the fossil fuels use, used to uh, mow them. Uh, and suddenly you have uh, new places that are uh, growing food, providing f healthy uh, food for communities, that increases community resilience, that reduces food deserts, uh, it creates new economic opportunities. It takes millennials, the goal was to target millennials, it takes them out of the consumer economy, gets them back and moving in with their parents, which would have been a great opportunity to recreate multi-generational housing and reduce the impact of all this oversized housing that we have in America. So for me, it was as as Bob said, it was an effort to kind of normalize degrowth using the culturally relevant frame of reality television. I will show you one clip. We never produced the whole series. Uh, it's hard to sell a Trojan horse for degrowth. 
on uh, mainstream media. But we did go far enough where we did a call for contestants and had six young millennials uh, join us. My name is Julie Pierre, I'm 26, and I live in Audubon, New Jersey, and I am a yard farmer using people's unused lawn space. People come every week, so it's 45 families um, that I'm feeding with this food. This is our backyard here, there's the greenhouse, there's our wash station, there's a lot of stuff you need, and there's like nowhere to put anything. It's my garlic craft, each individual clove is what you plant. And then that grows a whole new bowl. I'm so shocked that these people just let some some girl like come dig up their whole yard. I don't think people will. Oops. Let's. Stop it there. But the point is, I mean, as she said, Julie said, 45 families she was, she was uh, providing food for. She had a, a, about an, I think, an acre and a half under production already. She was in the, in the archetypes of the show. You know, you had the newbies, you had, um, you know, different people uh, playing different roles, and she was the veteran of the group. She had already yard farmed for a full year. Uh, before we, um, before she heard about this call for contestants, and um, had ag had an agreement with the town of Audubon to take this half an acre that they were just mowing, and convert that into a a, um, a source of, of food production, plus I think five or six different um, yards around the town, uh, some of which did better than others. Right, so the, hers was a learning process. She actually wrote a nice piece for. The yard farmer's website at one point talking about how to how to um, tell yard owners, you know, no, sorry, I, I don't actually want your yard anymore, right? So there's a whole set of knowledge um, that's being developed around sufficiency farming in suburban areas now. Uh, in fact, including an, around um, urban agricultural law, uh, which is a new field that's happening. So. But so there's real opportunity to figure out a path. Um, sorry, we'll let you uh, go. We won't stare at you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, a real economic opportunity to figure out untapped niches that are going to become more and more important as the transition unfolds. And I certainly would say small scale farming, maybe not as, the, as a completely independent um, income stream. I mean, Julie, without living at her parents, would she be able to make ends meet? I don't know. Um, but then again, that's how we've done things throughout history. We had multi-generational uh, house, households that brought different benefits and resources into the family. Some brought in hard currency, others brought in food, others provided child care or elder care, and so on. The last uh, piece I would add of those four, and, and you know, this is, this is, education is not a save all, of course, it's just one more piece of the puzzle, and especially talking to you know, an, an academic community, I would add education to the, to the mix. Um, because education right now is mostly not teaching us about sustainability or how to survive the transition, but Earth Ed, you know, ideally is that sweet spot where you actually are teaching both uh, education for sustainability and education that gets us able to be more resilient and able to communicate and share with our communities how to become more resilient. Um, and, and for us doing this project uh, at World Watch, you know, a lot of it was about, okay, what are those key skills that we need to, um, you know, the, the core uh, the core curriculum, in a sense, for Earth education. So we call that Earth Core, with Earth dependence on the on a very foundational level, in, and then interdependence or social connections, creativity, deep learning, life skills, which kind of penetrates throughout, and then at the peak, the pinnacle, Earth-centric leadership, which the idea is, the hope is that if you're actually learning your connection with Earth and, and learning how, you know, relationships and our interdependence with each other, 
um, you can kind of channel all of that you're learning into becoming a, a true servant of the earth and, and, and working towards sustainability. I'll, I'll just quickly go through some of the, the different pieces here, um, but not in, in depth. If, if anyone has questions about earth, earth education, I'm happy to, to kind of talk in, in more length. But ultimately at that foundation is reconnecting people with the earth. When I was a, a child, uh, too much of my time was spent indoors, you know, watching TV. I was not connected to nature. To I didn't understand that I was completely and utterly dependent on the earth for my well-being, and whether that's oxygen or fresh water or food. So that it needs to be that relationship needs to be cultivated intentionally. In fact, I'm lucky enough that uh, you know I'm I'm raising my one son that I have who's seven. Uh, to uh, you know, on Tuesdays he goes off to forest school uh, where he just spends six hours in the woods um, playing, uh, learning basic skills. Today, yes, that was yesterday. So today, or yesterday after forest school, he was telling me about the Phoebe nest that they found and and all different kind of games and they're they're gamifying all these basic nature skills at seven, uh, and it's it's amazing. I mean he knows far more than I did at that age uh, about the earth. And that's not just for little kids, but uh, this is an image of a, of a woman who cut down um, reeds and made a, a reed canoe in the indigenous style. Um, and, and there's so many different skills that can be learned um, that are both just fun pastimes right now, but are also um, going to have value in, um, you know, in the future. Um, as, as well as just having that understanding of, of environmental sciences, of sustainability science, um, all those together um, how, you know, is, is that earth dependence level. But then we also need the social emotional skills, the uh, character education or moral education, so that we understand that uh, we need to resolve conflict, we need to not polarize as a society, but actually work together and have, and have the skills and um, and the socio-emotional learning to, to work together through these conflicts that are going to become inevitable in our future. Um, as resources become more limited, um, we're going to have to figure out how to distribute these resources. Um, and the default is I'm bigger and stronger, so I take it. And that's not where we want to go, or that's going to lead to far more violence and disruption than, than necessary. Uh, creativity, I mean, th there are going to be problems and, and ch changes that are happening so fast that without this creativity to adapt and figure out new ways of, of being and, and, and not just new technologies but new ways of living, um, you know, creativity is very important in the mix as well, as is deep learning or, or the ability to learn how to learn. Uh, and that ultimately is, is you know, critical thinking, systems thinking. Uh, there's opportunities to develop that at college, in, 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 in high schools, even in prisons. These are images of, of prisoners who are now, um, you know, really through this sustainability in prisons project, uh, now kind of world-renowned experts in different fields. The, the man in a white t-shirt is actually, people are flying out to learn about his, his state-of-the-art vermicomposting or worm composting system that he created at this prison. Uh, and there are others that are writing journal articles with, with scientists about um, effective uh, pollination strategies and, and so on. So there's opportunity at all different levels and in, in all different communities to um, integrate sustainability education and the skills that will be valuable uh, at the community level. And I'd say that the life skills are in that same plan. The, the planning for, for the collapse or collapse now um, having those different basic skills, whether basic engineering, um, uh, like in Thailand, this uh, high school uh, really focuses on social entrepreneurship and giving you know, basic engineering and, and, and those kind of skills. Um, whether um, sex education, uh, there's a whole chapter on comprehensive sexuality education, which is normal in some cultures, like in the Netherlands, where from six years old you're starting to talk sex ed. Um, proper hugging, proper touching, when is it okay uh, to express feelings, all that, and it goes out through your, through your education. Rather than having it be a taboo, 
where um, you know, kids don't learn how to protect themselves, increases in unwanted pregnancy, in un unwanted attention, uh, and, um, and sexually transmitted diseases, all of which, uh, pregnancy and diseases, have s significant sustainability impacts as well. And then ultimately all these hopefully come together for this Earth-centric leadership, which you know, manifests you know, in all different ways. You know, um, this is a picture of the school in, in Bali, the green school in Bali, where uh, students actually got mobilized and uh, ended up uh, getting a ban of plastics in, uh, in Bali uh, through a combination of petitioning, uh, media action, even a hunger strike at one point. Uh, but an even better example than this now is the climate uh, strike, uh, where you know there's so much opportunity to become a leader in pushing your school to divest from fossil fuels, to um, you know become more sustainable, uh, and pushing your communities more broadly to be uh, you know to get to move to that transition. So I, I'll stop there. I mean I think the key is ultimately we're in trouble. Things are changing really fast. Uh, and we have the opportunity to act, right, at the, at the, at the individual level, getting, gaining skills, shifting educational priorities, at the uh, community level, resisting, mobilizing, uh, and at that kind of job level or, or societal engineer level. Um, all, of, all of us can be societal or cultural engineers, um, you know, using your job, using your position in in life, whether that's a teacher or a marketing expert or a policymaker or, or what have you, and use your influence to really start shifting cultural norms so that sustainability isn't kind of a marginal issue or even taboo, but is really at the center of our future. So thank you. <laughs>